Hello, fiendlings. How the hell are you? I haven't managed much progress on Extinction since we last spoke, mainly because a short-term contract fell into my lap. I spent a lot of time this week on coding and felt manic while doing it. In a way, it was a nice respite. The biggest difference, creatively speaking, between code and writing is that with code, I can hit a button on the IDE or issue a command to the console and immediately see results in my endeavors. It's like getting a mental paycheck every time a test passes. The same can and cannot be said for writing stories. With code, the green bars of a passing test say you did something. Finishing a chapter is just finishing a chapter. No one pats you on the head and says, good chapter. To my knowledge, no instant critique of a writer's work exists, and even if it did, would you really want to hand your rough draft over to it? With writing, I try and gauge my success in two ways. One, did I write the best story I could? Two, did some folks like it? Rule of thumb is to focus on the first so that the second happens. It's impossible to write a story everyone will enjoy, let alone love, or pay for. But trying to see an entire book as a test case is ridiculous. Just as applications are a conglomeration of hundreds to millions of lines of code, stories are composed of beats, scenes, characters, dialogue, and the like. That means a scene is a scene, a bite-sized portion of story that depends on what came before and is likely used by something else later in the tale. For novels, beats lead to scenes, lead to chapters, lead to a book. Making your living by writing is a long game, while code is a relatively short one. Both involve specialized skills mostly born out of trial and error, practice, and study. Both disciplines involve imagination with an eye for structure and a love for play and refinement. I may bitch about editing, but as my fellow writer Terry Mixon says, the craft is in the editing. With both code and story, you have to be willing to go back and edit what you've written, make it better, more succinct, and less buggy. You never get to walk away without having to go back and fix something. If you've never tried to program and are at all interested, give it a shot. You might be surprised by what you can create without too much effort. Oh, and the same goes for writing. Give that a try, too. Since it's Friday, I have more mischief to manage and a rough draft to get back to, so I'll just say, be safe, have a great week, and we'll talk again real soon. Here's episode 16 of Station 3. Chapter 23 Zilf moved as slowly and silently as the suit allowed. Each servo whine, however, sounded as loud as the inhuman shrieks he'd heard in the cleaning station. Zilf willed his heart to slow and himself to relax, to take his time. Without an EET covering his back, much less the other side of the hatchway, he had to assume he could be attacked from any angle apart from the deck itself. Unless they come up through the floor, he thought again, and cursed himself for the shivers it gave him. Step. Step. His suit lights banished the shadows on the left side, and he choked back his gorge. A fractured, severed human arm lay on the ground in a dried pool of blood and green goo that had left a yellow stain on the deck and the exposed flesh, the upper humerus sticking out like an errant stick. Worse, it looked as though it had been chewed on. His external mics caught the sound of a whispery hiss, and he froze. That hadn't been steam or gas released by the HVAC. That had been something alive. Zilf swished from his plasma torch to the stunner. It might not stop the creatures in their tracks, but it might give them a little incentive to move away from him, or at least be wary. He shifted the wrench in his hand and clutched it tightly as though its existence would somehow protect him. If the thing in here was smaller than what had been on the upper level, he might stand a chance. Might. Zilf stood in place and lazily panned left to right, the lights briefly chasing away the shadows and revealing the rest of the damaged control center. The four control consoles, four due to Shensho's quadruple redundancy policy, appeared mostly intact. One even had a command line prompt blinking at the corner of the hollow display. Power. Access. All he had to do was clear the room. He moved to take another step and stopped himself. A glance upward showed him what he'd hoped didn't exist. Vents. The room had six of them, one open and encrusted with green goo while the others remained clean and intact. Deep scratches on the ceiling and the walls told him that something had scrambled up the bulkhead like a spider, and it clung to the ceiling before disappearing into the vent. Or the other way around, Zilf muttered. The latter was somehow more disturbing. He imagined sitting at the console, staring at alarm after alarm in utter disbelief and panic as a vent popped open and something alien dropped down to attack, 
or crawled along the ceiling in silence until it found the perfect target. With the sound of the alarms blaring, how could anyone in here have possibly heard something moving around? No auditory alarms now, though. Either they'd been silenced manually, or the system had shut them off when the refinery imploded. Either way, the room was a tomb. Except for the hiss. He whipped around to cover the front of the room, his lights panning and searching. Nothing. Several power blocks, each standing over a meter high, created a blind spot. Something could be lurking behind them and just waiting for its moment to leap at him. Yes, that's where it was. He was sure. He cleared his six one more time just to make sure something wasn't creeping behind him, activated all of his suit cams and spread them across his HUD. The translucent windows in his vision would flash if they detected movement and give him an idea of what to shoot at. Don't you mean swing at? Yuri would have said. Zilf grinned in spite of himself. Swing, yes. Blast with the stunner and swing for the fences, as Griggs would say. The man was a baseball fanatic. A wide aisle led to the front of the room and the control blocks. Zilf crept as silently as he could down the aisle, flinching at nearly every sound his boots and the servos made. Every second or two, he looked above him to make sure he was far enough away from the vents. The closer he came to the front of the room, the more impossible it became to avoid the nearest closed vent. Fortunately, the open vent was on the opposite side of the room. That didn't make him feel all that much better, though. If one of those big things with the spindly legs dropped down, he'd be easy pickings for those, well, whatever it was they spat. With that in mind, he crouched lower, the wrench held inward at the elbow. As he neared the metal blocks, the hissing sound came again, a little louder, a little closer. Zilf took a deep breath and peered around the block's corner. A human body lay on the ground, chest rising and falling, mouth a savage hole with broken teeth. The missing arm had been cauterized, presumably with the portable welding torch held in the woman's right hand. A tungsten ring on her third finger sparkled brightly in his lights. Zilf activated his external speakers and he knelt next to the beaten and bleeding woman. One of her eyes stared lifelessly at the ceiling, its color already draining to a milky white. She tried to say something, but a bubble of blood burst from her mouth instead. I'm Zilf, he said softly. He wanted to touch her, reassure her, let her know another human being was talking to her and with her, but he doubted his armored hands would be much comfort. What can I do? Her good eye swiveled in its socket before focusing on him. Her mouth moved again, but all he heard was that whispering hiss as another bubble of blood burst on her ripped and torn lips. He turned up the gain on his mics and asked again. This time, he heard raspy, broken, gurgling words. Kill me. Zilf blinked at her, although she couldn't see it. The rips through her clothes told him she had at the very least suffered a punctured lung and massive internal damage. It was amazing she was still breathing at all. All the comfort I can give, he thought, and placed a hand on her head. He extended his knuckles slightly just to brush her skin. I'm sorry, he said. We tried. Her body vibrated and shook. Seizure. Zilf cursed Li Zhao for not being here and clamped his glove around her neck. It wouldn't take much pressure. Between the servos and his own innate strength, he could snap her neck like a twig. Her hand let go of the welding torch and grasped his forearm, good eye blazing with something like hate, as she lifted herself one last time, body still seizing. She opened her mouth wide, and a long, forked, spiked tongue flew out between the broken teeth and struck his visor. His hand loosened in surprise, the woman continuing to writhe and fight beneath his grip. Zilf watched the dead eye spin in its socket like a pinwheel, the milky color draining away to dull black. Her good eye, once a beautiful shade of blue, had darkened as well. The sclera all but disappeared. Changing, he said dumbly, his external speakers amplifying the word. The thing that had once been human tried to squirm out of his grip, sliding its body a few centimeters away. I'm sorry, Zilf said, and squeezed his armored fist tight. The servos barely whined, but the sound of her neck breaking was like a gunshot through his mics. The body went limp her remaining hand twitching a few times before falling silently to the deck. Zilf sat there for a moment, the danger of what was in the room momentarily forgotten. He'd killed before. Every EET who'd been on more than a few ops likely had, but this had been different. This hadn't been an aggressor or saboteur. This had been a human in pain, a human who needed his help, and all he'd been able to do was finish the job a creature, or another human, began.
Gami Akaret Vash, Zil said to the corpse. He'd heard the phrase a thousand times from his father and countless others, a way of wishing the dead that this be their last struggle, that heaven awaited them, that even the memory of pain would be beyond them. Words only fit for a corpse, Zil thought. He tore a swath of cloth from the woman's jumpsuit, placed it over her face, and repeated the Farsi phrase one last time before standing. She's dead. You're not. Get your ass moving. Something Reki would say. Zilf sighed. If only she were here now. Zilf listened for a moment, checked the area for movement, and gave himself the all clear. Mindful of any events, he moved to the first hollow console, the one with the blinking prompt. He touched the ghostly display and typed, Com's status. The interface thought for less than a heartbeat before the interface responded. Communications offline per sysop request. Restart required. Zilf nodded to himself and typed another command. Comms restart. Restarting appeared on the screen along with an ancient clock face. Somewhere beneath the deck, an array of computers had awakened and hopefully a microfusion reactor had kicked itself out of idle. It was probably too much to hope for a QE connection, but he'd take whatever he could get. All he had to do was let Recky know what had happened here. She'd have an idea of what was next. <laughs> Who was he kidding? Shin Sho would tell her what to do next. Tick tock, he wanted to say to the interface, as if that would make it hurry the fuck up. He wanted out of this dead place, this tomb. He wanted sound. Zilf stood completely still and held his breath. The sound came again and he raised his brows. It was like something sliding across the floor or maybe being dragged. It stopped for a moment, but a second later it returned. From the blocks again, he guessed. Had he missed something over there while he dealt with the injured woman? Or had a creature found its way in without him noticing? The hollow screen flashed. Comms restarted. Zilf grinned and typed again. Comms interface. The hollow screen blanked before a series of icons and menus appeared. He brought up the status screen, read the contents, and thrummed his armor fingers on the dais railing. QE, offline, insufficient power. ST, offline, station, tether not responding. S1, online warning, intermittent signal received. S3, offline, sysop lockout. Lockout? He flexed his fingers to type another command and find out about the lockout, but he needed to talk to Reki. Now. Zilf connected his suit to the comms interface and waited for a few beats. Interface established flashed on his HUD. He brought up Reki's comms frequency and attempted to connect. After three failures, he finally got a signal. Reki was on the line. Zilf! Her voice sounded jumbled, digital artifacts interspersing her words. Where are you? Station 2, ECC, Zilf said. Not sure if comms will hold. Understood. Sit rep. Refinery imploded, Griggs and Harvey missing, Yuri is... He paused before bringing himself to say the word, his voice choked with the effort. K-I-A. Recky responded faster than he thought she would. Copy K-I-A. Where did you lose Griggs and Harvey? In the refinery, Zilf said. We tried to stop the meltdown, but were unsuccessful. Griggs and Harvey were supposed to wait for us, but were gone when we arrived. Tick, tock, tick, tock. His mind kept repeating the words with every beat. He waited for Reki's response. The sliding, dragging sound found his mics again, and he looked over in that direction, his helmet light providing more than enough illumination. Nothing there. Or if there was, it remained below his line of sight. Your orders are to proceed to Station 3, she said. You're going to have to get into the water to do that. He clenched his teeth and ground them. Swim? he asked dumbly. Check the emergency exit room. Should find an escape craft there. Shen Shou says there should be nine of them. A file hit his comms and he accepted it. It had coordinates and guidance information he could feed to the escape craft, assuming there was one. Copy, he said. A red line appeared across his HUD, followed by a connection unstable. Digital noise filled his ears for a moment before disappearing again. Do not trust Harvey, she said. Destroy Station 3. Zilf frowned. Confirm. Harvey is aggressor. Station 3 is to be destroyed. Confirm all. Recky didn't even pause. Confirmed. Is there a reason? Hundreds, she said. Just know that... Signal lost. The hollow screen flashed a warning. Insufficient power reserves. Reactor shutting down. The hollow screen winked out of existence, along with all the warning lights in the room. 
he was once again completely alone. Chapter 24 Zilf's fingers passed through where the hollow screen should have been, as if triggering the sensor would somehow bring it back to life. Nothing happened. The panicked animal, dormant since his escape from the upper level, gnawed at his mind. No help coming. No information. All he had were coordinates, a lack of plasma fuel, and no fucking plan beyond that. Zilf sighed. He wanted to close his eyes and sleep. Just a little rest, maybe get his bearings, recount. The sliding sound again. Much louder this time. He tore his eyes from the non-existent hollow display image and peered to the right. There, just making its way around the corner, was a hand. An all-too-familiar-looking hand, although it was far too small to be that of one of the creatures he'd fought upstairs. Something glinted off one of the fingers. Tungsten ring, Zilf said dumbly. Fuck. The hand dug its fingers into the metal, and as Zilf watched, chitinous spikes spread from the fingernails. Steel squealed as the nails fought to gain traction on the smooth metal surface. Zilf remained frozen in both horror and wonder as the rest of the thing came into view. Its remaining arm had both lengthened and thickened. The flesh rippled, and the limb broke in two places, a horrible grinding and crunching noise as it clicked back into place. Now it had two additional joints. The thing finally dragged itself into view. The woman was dead. Whatever this was dragging itself toward him had once been human, but the four new eyes that had sprouted from its face, the ripped and torn mouth reformed into a roughly circular maw, made it clear that was no longer the case. Forgetting about the comms, he took three steps forward toward the thing and lifted his foot above its face. Its tongue, forked and spiked, but now greenish-brown in color, flicked out and struck his leg. Die, Div, he whispered, and brought his foot down with as much force as he could. The armored boot crushed the thing's skull with the wet crunch of a heavy rock thrown on thin, fresh ice. Green, red, and brown chunky liquid squirted in all directions, the substance reaching the tips of his boots. The hand trembled, the fingers continuing to scrabble for purchase. Sylph brought his boot down again, this time on the limb itself. Another crunch. A finger still moved. Sylph repositioned and brought his foot down again and again. When he was finished, he stood in a yellowish-brown pool of mashed flesh, chips of bone or chitin, and shredded jumpsuit. Just to be sure, he crushed the legs as well as the torso. Nothing remained of the creature but fragments and fluid. The sight made him nauseous. The word desecration entered his mind, and for just a moment he felt regret. Not desecration if the fucking corpse is still moving, he said to himself. The words made him feel better. His father would probably have said the same thing, but without the curse and with much more flowery language. Zilf suddenly missed his father. The tungsten ring still glinted in his lights, but now it was little more than a jagged piece of flat metal. She might have been married. A trinket might be all that was left of her in the world, all her partner could ever have of her again. Zilf reached down, activated his glove's magnetics, and the tiny bar stuck to a finger. He pried it off and placed it in his pouch. You don't even know her name, a voice sounding like Yuri said in his mind. Didn't matter. He'd worry about that if he ever made it off Xiao too. Zilf took one last survey of the room, his eyes searching for another threat. Nothing moved. Nothing made sound. He was alone. Still mindful of the vents, he made his way from the dais and headed to the open hatch, eyes flicking between cam views to make sure something wasn't following him. The ECC, however, remained dark and dead. When he stepped into the corridor, he closed the hatch behind him as silently as he could. If there was something in the vents in that room, he didn't want to alert it any more than he already had. He also hoped the hatch would keep any creatures busy for a minute or two. The corridor remained clear and the tracks on the coated floor were as dry and dead as before. Nothing had come down here while he'd been inside the ECC. Exhaling a sigh of relief, he continued down the corridor to the massive hatch marked Emergency Exit. Frosty drops of moisture clung to the other side of the thick, glass porthole. Zilf put his visor practically to the glass and looked inside, his lights penetrating the frost and into the room. The massive space should have contained nine emergency submersibles, each vehicle large enough to hold at least 15 suited workers. There were, however, only eight boats. The one that should have been in the middle was missing. Someone got out of here, Zilf said aloud. Griggs and Harvey, maybe. 
Or perhaps a group of workers had actually managed to get down here before, well, before whatever had happened, happened. Don't trust Harvey, Recky had said, her voice emphatic and deadly cold. What had the bastard done? Obviously, Recky knew something he didn't. If the comms had only stayed on a little longer, he'd have some answers. All he had instead were orders, coordinates, and questions. He readjusted his grip on the wrench, took a deep breath, and pulled the hatch's manual release. A puff of pressurized air hissed through the cracks before the steel door swung open. He turned his lights to full ambient and walked inside, looking like a flaming spear. The strong ambient light did little to banish the shadows around the support craft, but he could see enough to get an idea of what might have happened here. The long streaks of green goo, handprints, and mixture of red blood and brown gunk made it rather clear. Someone, maybe a dozen someones, maybe more, had tried to escape and obviously hadn't made it. That led to the next question. Where were the corpses? He glanced upward for vents, although he knew he wouldn't find any. This room was essentially an airlock maintaining pressure to keep the ocean from pouring inside. Curious, he looked on the other side of the hatch. It was clean of color of any kind. No one tried to get back out, not even the creatures. So where did they go? The hatch was closed. Zilf's fingers loosened and tightened in a rhythm matching his heartbeat. Think. What is there to think about, turtle? Shark swims. He looked at the nearest submersible, the letters X2S2B9 inscribed on its side in glowing blue luma paint. Still looking at nothing and everything, he walked to the dock for sub-9. Splatters of color stippled the deck coating and the dried gunk crackled beneath his feet. As he approached the hatch to sub-9, its bulbous cabin blocked his view of the rest of the bays. That was fine. He'd be out of here in a minute or two. He wrapped a knuckle against the vehicle's hatch, and it opened into a brightly lit space with enough seats for 15 suits. In addition to the seats, several standing stations were built into the sub's bulkheads, along with a small rear airlock. The sound of a hatch opening caught his ears, and Zilf nearly knocked his head into the top of the hatchway before quickly entering the vehicle, shutting the hatch behind him, and locking it. A beat later, something thudded against the porthole. A man, his jumpsuit covered in grime and the leavings of both the creatures and dead humans, stood panting outside the hatch. He was yelling, Zilf was sure, but it was impossible to hear him in the soundproof cabin. Zilf watched patiently, expecting the man's flesh to ripple and squirm as though something were crawling beneath it. Instead, the man flipped him off and smashed a wrecking bar into the porthole. Might be infected, Zilf thought. But might not be, his father's voice, the voice of his conscience, said. You couldn't save the first. Can you save him? Good question. Considering what he'd seen in the ECC, not to mention what was on the level above, he doubted this man would last long. Sooner or later, the creatures would come looking for another meal, or maybe create another creature. Neither will matter if you follow orders and just kill him, Recky's voice echoed in his mind. He ignored it. The man mouthed open up over and over again as he continued smashing the wrecking bar against the glass. Zilf would have been concerned about that, but he knew the bar couldn't perforate it. At best, it could scratch the material. Using his wrench, he gestured for the man to step back. His eyes blinked at Zilf as if he couldn't believe what he was seeing, and instead of complying, he smacked the porthole again. Zilf gritted his teeth, unlocked the hatch, and swung it open. Through his external mics, he heard the man's labored breathing, and although the suit had no olfactory sensors, Zilf could practically smell both the panic and fear on him. The man swung the bar again, completely oblivious to the fact Zilf had already opened it. Knowing what was about to happen, Zilf merely held up his wrench and the smaller piece of metal clanked impotently off of it. The man staggered backward, his bones no doubt ringing with the vibration from the two pieces of metal colliding. Fuck! A man yelled. Zilf remained motionless, his makeshift melee weapon held fast in front of him like a shield. For a moment, the two men traded stares, although all Zilf's assailant could see was himself in the mirrored visor. Get me out of here, the man finally said in a high-pitched squeal. Zilf didn't move. Who are you? The man's mouth opened, closed, and opened again in disbelief. Who? What's your name and title, Zilf said again, his voice devoid of emotion. The man made a squawking sound that slowly turned into a deranged giggle. Demontier, Stefan, systems engineer. Get in, Zilf said, and moved aside. 
Demotier, Stefan, rushed past Zilf and inside the vehicle with a look of surprise still on his face. Zilf shut the hatch, locked it, and turned as quickly as he could to face the man. Demontier had backed up to the far bulkhead, his wrecking bar still held like a baton in one arm. E.E.T.? Zilf nodded. My name is Zilf. The man's look of shock faded into exhausted relief, the wrecking bar falling to his side. Shinsho or S1? Shinsho, Zilf said. Got here a few hours ago. What happened here? Demontier shook his head. I don't know. Alarms running and... He paused for a moment before swallowing hard. Things. I hit a number five when those things came in. Zilf furrowed his brows. Hide. Why didn't you leave? Nothing fucking works, he yelled. The computers didn't respond. Kept saying offline over and over again. Then how did Sub-7 leave? Demotier spat. The other EETs? They scrambled into number seven and left before I could reach them. I think one of them saw me, but... His face turned into an expression of nuclear rage. They fucking left me here! Griggs probably overrode the lockout, Zilf thought. The escape vehicles had been locked out? Why would someone do that? Quarantine was the simplest answer. Whomever had started this shit show had been at least smart enough to try and limit the creatures from spreading, maybe even keeping them from reaching the alien ocean. Zilf pointed at the man as nonchalantly as he could. Demotier didn't need to be spooked further. I'm going to the controls. Please stay right here and do not move. Demotier blinked. Why? Because I don't trust you yet, Zilf said. Please do not give me a reason to use violence. I know you know what this suit can do. Demotier backed up to the bulkhead, dropped the wrecking bar, and raised his hands. I do. I'm chill. Zilf nodded and turned, but kept his mics at a high gain. If the engineer tried to pick up the wrecking bar again, Zilf would hear him, and the man would receive a full stun blast. Not fatal, mind you, but enough to temporarily paralyze him and hurt like hell for the next few days. Activating the interface was as simple as making a connection to it. The lockout? Impossible for anyone that didn't have the codes. Or an EET suit. Zilf terminated the lockout and quickly checked system status. The submersible reported all systems nominal, except for one. Navigation. S1 comms tether offline. Can't find home, huh? Zilf said to the console. He tapped the manual choice on the interface and was presented with a slew of options. He could, if he wanted to, actually pilot the vehicle. Instead, he selected the coordinates option and fed it the file Recky had given him. Destination Station 3. Confirm? Station 3? Demotier yelled from behind him. No, I'm not fucking going to Station 3. The man had started to sob. Zilf turned and stared at him. The refinery imploded, he said calmly. The emergency rings are gone, and we have no way of knowing if the lift is operational. Station 3 is our best choice. No, it's not. You might as well sink us. And why is that? Zilf asked. What do you know about Station 3? Demotier shook his head. It's where those things came from, through the umbilicals. Don't take us there. Demotier kept eyeing the wrecking bar on the floor, just in case Zilf kept the stunner pointed at the man's feet. I have my orders, Zilf said. I have to go to Station 3. You can either come with me, he said and pointed at the locked hatch, or stay out there. Your choice. Demotier's eyes swung from Zilf to the hatch, and for a moment, Zilf was sure the man would unlock the hatch and walk right through it. If Zilf was honest with himself, he might do the same after what he'd seen, but he had an EET suit and he had orders. That's not a choice, Demotier muttered. Zilf nodded. Then you understand. Demotier wiped a rage-filled tear from his eye and glared. I understand, he said, his voice raspy and choked with phlegm. Good, buckle up. The man complied by sitting in the front row next to Zilf's hulking form. Demotier secured the five-point harness and looked up expectantly at Zilf. You standing? Always, Zilf said, and tapped the confirm button.